Hello everybody, and welcome to our discussion on creating and editing spatial data. Here you'll learn how to create your own vector data sets from scratch, such as if you're defining your research analysis area polygon, or maybe drawing roads or trails in an area that are previously unmapped. You'll also see how to take existing vector data sets and modify them, maybe correcting errors or adding or deleting features. We'll also look at how to convert a table of data like you might get in an Excel worksheet and turn that into an actual spatial data set. Finally, we'll take a look at how to take images and turn them into spatial data. These images might come from a drone or maybe some screenshot you got off the internet. They could be a map or picture you've scanned or taken a photograph of. And I'll show you how to turn that into actual spatial data that you can bring into your map. We're going to cover three common methods for creating spatial data in this lecture. First off, the heavy duty work in vector data is done using the sketch and the editor tools. The editor toolbar has several tools that allow you to just draw or sketch the geometry right here on the map. Editor tools use something called templates, which makes it, these things make it easier to create data that fall into predefined categories. And we're going to learn about setting the snapping environment, which allows us to create new vector data that are guaranteed to connect correctly with adjacent or coincident features. Another common way to create point feature classes is to just turn a table of coordinates into a point feature class, and we'll look at how to do this. We'll see how to turn a point feature class of points into polylines by stringing them together, and we'll learn how to georectify an image so that it conforms correctly to the real world. All right, let's get started on the sketch. We're going to make a lot of use of the sketch in this lecture and in the labs. This is ArcGIS Pro's primary method to create spatial data, or at least create vector spatial data, and it lets you just draw it out on the screen. We're going to take a look at different geometry construction tools available in the editor toolbar, and we can see different tools are available for creating points and polylines and polygons, and we'll look at methods for editing existing features. Now here's a typical editing workflow when you're creating vector data. We'll go through these steps together in the lab, but these are generally the steps you're going to take. First thing you do is you create a new empty feature class. You do this in the catalog view. Then you add that new empty feature class to your map. You set your new feature layer to be the only editable and selectable layer. And this, this step isn't really a hard and fast rule. Sometimes you do want to edit multiple feature classes at once. In that case, you'd have multiple ones set to be editable. But sometimes you want to select features from other data sets while you're working. And this might happen if you want to, say, copy and paste them from other data into your current feature class. But in general, setting your current layer to be the only one that is editable helps avoid errors such as accidentally deleting data from other data sets or possibly creating new features and putting them into the wrong feature class. Now, setting your current feature class as the only one that is selectable helps speed up your work when you're selecting stuff on the screen. It avoids this little pop-up window that asks you which layer you want to select from. Anyway, moving on. We use the Create tool in the Edit ribbon to add features to the new em empty feature class. And when we do this, we're going to set snapping parameters if we want our new features to you know, snap right to existing features. And you'll see how to do that. Now, the snapping parameter is kind of cool. You can snap to vertices, edges, endpoints of polylines and polygons, midpoints of polylines and polygons, intersection points between two different polylines or polygons, and you can even snap to tangent points on curve lines. I haven't ever had to do that one, but maybe you will someday. And you can also pick the layers you want to snap to by setting the, you know, the, the snapping option in the, in the contents pane. Okay, now we're ready to start creating features. First off, we have to pick a template of the layer to edit. And these templates just make the features quicker and easier to create. The template is actually a pretty cool method. It simplifies some of the tedious parts of creating spatial data, like manually entering attribute values for everything. Now, you can set default values in a template, meaning that each new feature you create will be automatically assigned those attribute values. And there's usually a template already available for your data set based on the current layer properties of the data set. This means if it's symbolized by unique values, then your template will reflect those unique values. And if you don't have a template, if you don't see a template automatically ready, then it's pretty easy to create. For example, maybe we want to make a point feature class of animal locations. Uh, maybe some locations are nocturnal, some are diurnal. Maybe this is an owl, behaves differently in the day and night. 
Now, nocturnal features always have certain attribute values, and the same with the diurnal. So, when we want to make the nocturnal locations, we just click on the nocturnal template and start clicking on the screen. Every point we make is marked as nocturnal in the attribute table. Then we want to make the daytime location, so we click on the diurnal template, click away on the screen, and all of these points have diurnal automatically written into the table. Now, when we're creating new features, we have to choose an appropriate construction tool to sketch it on the screen. With points, it's easy enough. It's pretty much, well, it's almost always just this little point construction tool. But when you have polylines you're creating, well, there's a whole variety of polyline construction tools you can make, and the same with uh, polygon construction tools. Lots of different ways you can create these objects. And in the lab exercises, we're going to try a couple of them, and so you'll get a little bit of experience with them. When we're editing an existing feature, then we select that feature and we use the appropriate shape modification tool to modify it. So there's a whole another set of tools just for modifying shapes. And for example, if we wanted to edit the vertices or add new vertices to some existing object, then this edit vertices will let us see all the individual vertices and we can start selecting individual ones and moving and deleting them. Or we could click on a line somewhere and right click and create new vertices wherever we wanted to. Okay, let's look at a simple example. Suppose I've created this polygon and now I want to edit it. All right, first I select it using the selection tool. Then I use the modify command to open up my tools to modify data. And they have some basic ones here. I could click the move tool and move it around. The rotate tool lets me spin it if that's, you know, if that's your thing. Uh, Control Z will always step you backwards through the various steps you've taken. Now, Maybe I want to edit vertices. I kind of like that tool. So I hit the edit vertices and it shows me all the vertexes here or vertices. I can select one and move it around. I can select it and delete it. I could select multiple ones and move the whole batch. I can insert a vertex. I could right click on the edge somewhere and go to add vertex. Now I got a new one I can play with. So yeah, you know, pretty simple to do. Then if I just hate what I've done, I just hit the Control Z key and it gets back to where it was. And that's all there is to it. When you finish drawing out your feature on the screen, then you have to finish the sketch. And finish is the, the term that Esri uses for exiting the operation where you're adding vertices. Normally you just click the F2 key to finish the sketch. And if for some reason that doesn't work on your keyboard, you can just right click on the sketch and, and choose finish in the list. You know, a common reason for F2 keys not to work is maybe the keyboard has a function lock key that got turned off. And that means none of the F keys really work. And so you just have to look for a key that says F lock and then click it. And then the F2 key should start working correctly. Now, after you've finished making all your edits, you hit the Save Edits command in the Edit ribbon, and, and that writes it to the feature class, so it's, it's stored properly. In the process of editing, if you don't like something you've done, you can always click the Control z key to undo any of the editing actions, and you can keep clicking Control z and it steps back through a whole series of things you want to change. Now, recommend that you save often because ArcGIS Pro does occasionally crash. And when it crashes in the middle of an edit session, that means you've lost everything you've done. So save early and often and you'll be thankful later. Okay, let's discuss the template. Template is basically a set of guidelines and a model for creating new features. And it's usually based on your layer symbology. If you have your layer classified by some attribute value, then the template will allow you to create new features that are automatically classified into your layer classes. In this example, new features are gonna be added to the layer Coconino Motor Vehicle Use Map Roads and are symbolized with an orange line. And they'll also be automatically assigned the attribute value roads open to highway legal vehicles only year long in the attribute field being used to classify the roads. These templates also allow you to set attribute values for new features or quickly create different classes of features such as local roads versus freeways, for example. Now you need to have this create features window open in order to select and edit templates. And if you don't see this window, click the create command in the edit ribbon to open it. 
Now, once you get it open, you can click on the Template Manager command to open the Template Properties window. And, and here you can set various defaults for the template, including default attribute values, such as automatically assigning specific attribute values for all new features. And you also can say which construction tools you want to have available when you're creating new features. Now here's a more sophisticated template used by the Coconino National Forest Roadmap. This illustrates how different classes of roads can be created easily. You simply choose the class of road you want to make and it'll get the appropriate operation maintenance level value automatically. And consequently it'll be symbolized correctly as you draw it. Now for example, if you select the high clearance of vehicles template, you start drawing new roads and all your new roads will automatically have that high clearance of vehicle attribute. It'll get symbolized correctly on the map. Go hit the Explorer tool and we use that to click on this road here. We see that it has high clearance vehicles written right into the operation maintenance level. So it's been written in there without us having to type it. If we wanted to create high degree of user comfort roads, uh, interstates for example, we could draw those just as easily. Hit F2, save that, hit the Explorer just to check the attribute values for that. And sure enough, see, it uh, wrote the attribute value right in there. So this is really nice. Uh, it means we don't have to type it in. It saves time and work on our end. And it also reduces typographical errors that you get when you manually type in every attribute value. Now snapping. Snapping is a simple way to make sure that your new features correctly touch or intersect other features in the map. For example, if you wanted to draw a new road on this map, you could make sure it started at exactly the pink line by snapping the road vertex to it. Snapping environment lets you pick the parts of features you want to snap to. For example, if you wanted to, you could set the snapping environment so that it would only snap to existing vertices rather than just any point on the line like you see here. And also remember that earlier in the lecture we discussed how we could choose exactly which feature classes we wanted to snap to. In this image, if I only wanted to snap to the pink line, then it's easy for me to set that rule. Let's take a look at how some of these snapping options work. Okay, I'm wanting to add some new streets to my Coconino Forest Roads map, and I see an image back here that shows me where a lot of streets are, so I just want to start creating them. So clearly there's a good street along here, so I want to make that a high degree of user comfort road. Well, I want it to start right at the current road, but if, you know, if I just start clicking, well, there's no guarantee that, it will, that I will really have nailed it. And if I uh, zoom into that, clearly I have missed by several feet. So that's a problem, right? Uh, it can be important for our features to connect correctly to existing features. And that's what that snapping environment is all about. So if I want it to snap right to this road, I can open up my snapping environment and here it is. And by the way, there is another way to get to the snapping environment right down here. You just hover your mouse over this and it'll open that same window. And anyway, we come back here. Uh, this option here is the one that lets me snap to an edge. So I turn that on. Now when I move my, my uh, cursor around, it hits that edge and snaps to it. I can start creating it now. Hit F2, Let's clear the selection. And now if I zoom into this spot right here, I can see that it is connecting perfectly. So that's just what I was hoping for. So I, I needed to be able to snap to that edge. Now there's other things that you can snap to, right? So you can snap to points. So in this case, I'm just turning on the single point. Well, these are points out here. There's a point feature class. If I wanted to create a new row that connected to a point, see now it snaps to the points. It doesn't snap to any edge though. I can snap to the endpoints of lines. So in this case, it won't snap to any part of the line except for the endpoint. So here's an endpoint, here's an endpoint. Here's an endpoint to the blue line, here's another endpoint to the blue line. So it'll only snap to those, it won't snap to any other part of the line. If I wanted to snap to any vertex in any of these lines, I could turn on that option, that's this one here. So I snap to vertices. Now it'll snap to any vertex in any of those lines. So as I move it 
starts snapping to all the possibilities. So there's vertices all along these objects. So snap to any of those. This intersection is pretty interesting. It'll only snap to areas where two polylines or two polygons touch each other. So it won't snap to anything in here, but as I get close to the intersection, it snaps. Another intersection is right over here. It snaps to that. So it's a special case of intersecting features, and the snapping will find such places. Oh, this one, a midpoint is kind of interesting. If, if, uh, if you need to snap to the centroid of something, uh, that's what you need. And so here's the centroid of a polyline. Here's a centroid of this polyline. Here's the centroid of this polyline. Uh, it can s snap to the centroid of this edge here. So if in, that, in the rare case that you need to snap right to the midpoint of something, uh, then this, this tool will do it. And lastly, this, uh, this snap to tangency is, like I said, it's, never, it's not one that I've ever uh, used. But if I wanted to make a new road that came from the end of this road and just touched tangently on the circle here, I would do a snap to endpoint snap to endpoint. Now when I create it, it'll snap to the endpoint and then I can start drawing. And as I get close to the circle here, it'll only snap to a tangent point. See, tangent right up here, tangent as well. So in that rare case that I need to snap to a tangent, then that's that's what I got. All right. That, that's a good demonstration of this and always remember you can un you can control Z to undo things and make sure to save your edits you're good to go now, now here's a common problem make sure that the feature class you're editing is above any background base maps or imagery if it's underneath an image you won't be able to see it as you edit and it kind of looks like it just disappears on you just to demonstrate this issue, let's go back to our roads here. My roads layer happened to be located underneath the imagery. Well, we can't see it to start with. That doesn't mean we can't edit it. So I could hit the Create command. I could go to my template. I want to make some nice high degree of user comfort roads. Well, this looks like a good road to me. So it all draws out just fine like that. Looks good. You think everything's good. You hit F2 to finish the sketch. Then when you clear the selection, well, the road disappears. Yes, because it's being drawn over the top by the imagery. So it's important to make sure that your layer that you're editing is visible atop the background stuff you're using. It's an easy problem to fix. Just go to your contents pane and drag that layer above any image layers that could be drawn over it. Okay, so we've covered how to use the sketch tool to create geometric features. Now let's move on to how to convert a table of coordinates to actual points. It's pretty easy to do. Um, very common activity in GIS. You'll probably do it if you ever want to take your, your GPS coordinates out of your GPS and bring it into ArcGIS. It's easy to do. Just load the table in your map. You right click on it and you choose display XY data. You need to specify what attribute fields contain the X and Y coordinates, of course. And remember that a table itself doesn't have any kind of projection information or spatial reference attached to it. You need to specify the projection and you need to specify the right one. Let's just look at a quick example. And you're actually going to do this exact same example in one of the labs, but I just want to show you how easy it is. All right, so I have a little text file of coordinates. This is just a normal old ASCII text file. I've got to open a notepad. Well, I've got the same thing open as a table. I've loaded it into ArcGIS Pro, so we've got the same information here. And you can look and see. Now, I want to turn this into actual point feature class. It's easy to do. I just right click on the layer. Go to display XY data. Need to make sure that I have the X and Y fields selected correctly. I have to make sure I have the right coordinate system. And if those coordinates in the table were in UTM or something, then I would definitely have to change this or else we'd be way off. Uh, let's give it a name to save it to. I'm going to call it points of interest. Okay, hit OK. That's all there is to it. Now it's an actual true point feature class. You can do all the normal spatial things you want normally do. If I wanted to, I could throw in some labels. I'm going to call it there. Label. It. There we go. Nice labels. I can change the symbology. Make you 
and easy to do. Okay, next topic. So far we've discussed two ways to create brand new spatial data. One using the sketch tool and the editor toolbar to create new vector data. One to convert a table of coordinates to actual points. And now we'll look at how to take an image and turn it into real spatial data. So you might get images from lots of places. You might scan an image out of a textbook or take a photograph of it. You might download an image file that just shows you a map of something. Well, sometimes you just want to take these images right into your map and do actual spatial analysis on them. And that's what this topic will cover. There's three general ways to do this. Uh, one is called georeferencing, and this is the simplest. It just locates the image on the map. It places it in the right spot, like you do with a world file, if you remember we talked about those. A more complex method is called georectifying. This can actually bend and warp the image to fit the landscape. It uses a special toolbar called the georeference toolbar, and that's what we're going to do in the labs today. The most complex method is called orthorectifying. It's, uh, it bends and warps the same way georectifying does, but it can also adjust for characteristics of the camera lens, and then it can drape that image properly over a DEM. Orthorectification requires data that are actually designed for orthorectification, and you don't get this from just a simple image file. But once you do have the right data, you can use the tools in this ArcGIS Pro ortho mapping suite to orthorectify. Here's what the orthorectification ribbon looks like, but we won't be doing this in class. We just don't have the data for it. So we're going to stick with georectifying. Now, georectifying is sometimes referred to as warping or rubber sheeting, so you see those terms occasionally. You, you warp the image based on a set of control points. So we know where the control points are on the landscape, and we know where these control points are on the image, and this lets us bend the image to fit the landscape. More control points allows you to do more complex warps. So there's several common warp transformations that you can choose from, depending on how many control points you have. What we call a zero order, which just shifts the image, uh, this just requires a single control point. This is actually equivalent to georeferencing, if you remember that simplest method. But once we start doing more interesting things, we, if we have three or more points, we can do this first order affine transformation. More than six points, we can get the second order, get 10 or more points, we can do a third order. So what do these first, second, and third order transformations look like? Georectifying the first order. This is the one that needs three or more control points. The affine transformation is notable in that any straight line in your original image will still be straight in the transformed image. It's similar to stretching or resizing or skewing. Um, there's no bending here. It's all stretching in various directions. The second order allows you to get a bend in one direction. And this means a straight line in the original image is probably going to be curved in the new image. So this is a second order transformation. Needs six or more control points. A third order lets you bend in two different directions, as you see here. And it takes ten or more points. Now, sometimes our image is more complicated, has different parts of the image that need to be warped in different ways. And you see this a lot with really old hand-drawn maps, or you see it with aerial photo composites that are combined from multiple images taken from different locations. Now, no single general polynomial transformation is reasonable in this case, because one part of the image might get warped properly, but the rest of it would be skewed badly. And that's where this spline transformation comes in handy. And the spline will warp each part of the image closest to a particular control point, and it forces that local region of the image to match that control point. The parts of the image that are closest to different control points are warped to match those other control points. Now this kind of warp will cause error throughout the image just because it's, it's applying so many different warps at different parts of it. But this is the best we can really do with these kind of images. And there just isn't any way to perfectly warp them to the landscape. Now there's something new and cool that's happening these days. This could never work without really powerful computers. But this new method takes a bunch of overlapping photographs, like you might get from a drone, and is able to generate a three-dimensional surface from these. Now this method will also produce a nice orthorectified image, so it, it's another good way of getting that kind of data. But the 3D surface is really cool. 
So from a bunch of photographs like this, and this happens to be uh, some water tanks over by Wapaki National Park, you can generate this cool three-dimensional surface. If you ever hear the term structure for motion, this is what they're talking about. It basically means to generate a model of the three-dimensional structure of an area based on moving around and looking at it from different angles. The data you can produce from this method can really be a lot of fun to play with. And here's an example looking at the petroglyphs out at Picture Canyon in East Flag, if you've never been out there. You can use a drone to take a lot of photographs at different angles and heights, and then from these pictures you can generate a 3D model of the rock face. Now, this particular one was especially cool for me because I found a lot of petroglyphs in the model that I'd never actually noticed when I was out in the area looking at it. We used to do this kind of thing manually with aerial photographs using these stereoscopes. And I think one of these stereoscopes is over there in room 135. You could generate contour lines off of overlapping images. And it's really kind of fun looking through these things and seeing the land rise up underneath you. Uh, some of you may have played with the old Viewmaster toys. If that did the same thing, gave you that three-dimensional image from overlapping photos. Now, we're not going to be doing this in this class, which is kind of unfortunate because it is fun and cool. The problem is that the true professional software that does this is just really expensive and NAU doesn't have a license. And the open source alternatives are kind of a pain to work with. I'm actually trying some of this open source software, so if you would like to discuss it and try this out, then let's, let's talk. But it's not something I can easily turn into a lab exercise. Let me know if you'd like to discuss it, though. We're able to take a bunch of images like this and turn it into a nice ortho photograph like this, and you can look at it at an angle. It, it, it's fun to play with. There's actually a DEM of the entire world that's available that's generated using this method. So there's a satellite system called Aster, which takes imagery similar to Landsat. Well, somebody realized that these Aster photographs overlapped each other, and therefore they could be used to make these digital elevation models as well. So you can download a DEM generated from Aster data for anywhere in the world. It's pretty cool, and it's free. Downside of this method for generating a DEM is, is that the vegetation shows up in the imagery too, and so the vegetation gets converted to elevation. So you get this rough surface that represents the surface of the canopy rather than the surface of the ground. It's not so bad when you're interested in the elevation of something, like what elevation range does some species exist at, but it's awful when you're trying to generate hydrologic functions over this surface. This rough surface just doesn't allow for accurate hydrologic modeling. It also adds a lot of noise to your slope and aspect rasters, so kind of get a lot of variation in these metrics that aren't really out there on the landscape. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about with creating and editing data, so let's get into the labs and enjoy. Mm -hmm. 